before I get started. I just want to make sure I have my Java. Otherwise, I won't be able to function very well. So let me get myself situated. Some nice hot water. Hey, Cozy Kramer, how are you? Good to see you. Afternoon, how's it going? How's it going in your neck of the woods? I'm just getting myself some Java. I need my coffee, otherwise I'll fall down. I don't want that to happen. How's your day going? Oh. There we go. Hopefully you can't hear too much water. We're going to be doing a bunch of DIY today. And it goes. It goes. <laughs> hey, just a guy. How's it going? Good to see ya. Oh my gosh, we had so much fun on just a guy stream last night. It was fantastic. I am so all over the peaches. My husband was so happy with the salsa. Whoops. Yeah. Oh, you have to deal with the real world shortly. Yeah, of course, Cozy. That's just the way it happens, isn't it? Sadly. I was dealing with the real world up until now. This is just going to be my, my time not to have to deal. <laughs> Reality. Oh, oh. You had a really long stream yesterday, just a guy, but it was awesome, I have to say. I was really impressed. It, it, And you know what? I actually didn't mind that you broke the jars because, I mean, that's real life. And the fact is, you know, it's, it's nice to see how to handle that kind of stuff when it happens, you know, in real life. It's not all perfection like you see on the, on the food blog websites. It, everything is not just perfection. And I think that's the beauty of live streaming. <laughs> well, reality does pay bills. That's right. That's right. So yeah, when you got to go and deal, go and deal. Cozy Kramer, I'm glad you popped by though. That's awesome. Thanks so much for the support. My day's going pretty good. Just a guy. I got... We're doing so many small DIYs today, so I had a lot of little fiddly things to have to get organized. So it was, uh, I got lots of little fingers and lots of little pies going on here today, but it's going to be really, really good because this is going to be some key things that you didn't think you could DIY and you know what, you can do it, at, do it yourself, do it cheaper, do it yummier. And what I'll do is I'll try to answer questions as we're going. Um, and if you have any, just shout out. Okay, great. Cozy. Once you have to leave, just say, hey, gotta go. No worries. Okay, so what are we making today? We are making homemade mustard. And I'm going to have all the recipes on the Discord, so not to worry. Okay, so we're going to do homemade mustard. First time in here, but talked at it a little before, so I had to check everything out. <laughs> well, I'm glad you I'm glad you popped by. Okay, so we are doing homemade mustard. We're doing a homemade teriyaki sauce that you can freeze in batches, so you'll always always have it. We're doing homemade ricotta cheese, which is so fast it's insanity. Then we get to get into the sweet stuff. We're gonna do homemade hot chocolate mix. Uh, DIY brown sugar, just a guy. Hey, mom noms in the house. Hope you had a good night last night. I heard it. It was exciting, but you did awesome. You killed it at your catering. Happy, happy. And you were able to sort out the vegetarian. Woohoo. Thinking on your toes. <laughs> ah, there you go. Um, the teriyaki sauce is awesome because I actually put the teriyaki sauce because I'm inherently lazy on my meatballs. I do chicken. I do, I, I make it as a dip. You can actually thin it out a bit and have it as a dip. You can put it on your stir fries, whatever. So I like to make 
some bigger batches and then I freeze them in portions and lay them flat and then when I need it boom so tonight I'm going to be throwing in some chicken wings and because I'm making replenishing my teriyaki sauce I'm going to use teriyaki sauce it'll be awesome and then of course the brown sugar the magic shell is going to be fun and you know what we're going to get all of this done really really quickly no worries we're going to start with the savory and end with the sweet of course of course of course so i'm going to get started so i actually made a new batch of mustard last night so that i could demo this for you and it's going to be so quick your head's going to spin now the mustard that i'm talking about <laughs> slather it on everything you're right absolutely and the fact you can just throw it throw it from the freezer heat it up boom bob's your uncle done okay so this is the mustard that i made last night it's not quite done yet we're going to do the final steps um, but i'm going to take you for the steps up to this point and then we're going to finish off this mustard now okay but this is uh day before yesterday actually la night before last so it takes about 24 hours okay so uh we're gonna we're gonna take it up to here and we're gonna finish it off now what we're making is grain mustard okay that's the really pricey expensive stuff you find in the grocery store and it's all beautiful and it tastes amazing and then you can sit there and you can get dijon mustard and all of these things so I discovered this because I got a little little tiny itty bitty jar in a gift basket one time so I thought well I'll try it I loved it and then I went to the grocery store and saw how stupid expensive it was oh so I decided I would figure out how I was gonna make it myself because I'm cheap and I'm lazy so what I come to realize is that all mustard is basically just from mustard seeds and the key thing with the grain mustard is it's a mixture of the white or yellow and brown seeds. So you've got white or yellow, brown, and black seeds. Black is the strongest. So strong. Brown is middle, white is mild. So the yellow mustard, American mustard, is usually just ground yellow or white mustard. That's what makes it so mild. Now when you're making it, if you soak it in in cold water you're going to hold on to the strength of the mustard if you soak it in warm water a lot of the strength of the pungency of the mustard is going to go away so and it depends on the vinegar that you use as well the the grain mustard is amazing because too you get to control all the heat too because we're going to grind this up a little bit just a titch because if you break up the seeds the strength of the flavor it gets stronger i don't like really hot spicy stuff so i usually just give it a couple of little whirls but that's it so what do you do with this mustard i make um dressings with it with some yogurt a little bit of milk this and a little pinch of honey that's a beautiful honey mustard dressing a uh, honey mustard dip for veg which is just no thinning of the sauce I will make chicken and put mayonnaise on the chicken with whole grain mustard on top and bake it with a bit of Parmesan. This stuff, you can put it on everything and it is so, so good. So we are going to get busy with the mustard. It is so simple, it's gonna make your head spin, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with some water. Let me get you over to the cutting board here where all the action is going to happen so we're going to start with a quarter of a cup of cold water because i don't want it to lose too much of that strength and since i'm not grinding it up it's not going to be all that strong to begin with okay so what we're going to do is we're going to add get a nice clean jar clean it really well in the dishwasher is fine it works like a charm so we're going to pour our water into our jar and we're going to use a mixture of the brown and the white mustard so I'm going to use a quarter cup of each of it and that's about 43 grams and whoop, 
This is why I usually use a scale there. And I'm going to use the scale for the other part. So that I just have to pour these puppies into the jar. Okay, so. Get 43. Okay. And I'm going to do a little extra. There we go. Okay, so we've got our mustard in here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to give it a couple of minutes to get it started. Start soaking it up, okay? And you want to let the water start doing its action on the mustard before we add the vinegar. So I like to put vinegar and water. If you just do um, water, then what ends up happening is um, like we know that the cold water will help keep its pungency, okay? And the acid will also have an effect on the strength of the mustard. So if you're like me and you don't like uh, it too, too, too strong, do a nice mix of water and an acid. You can do wa um, wine vinegars. You can, you can do all manner of things and you can actually add stuff. This is going to be your basic mustard. I used to add a little bit of brown sugar at the end, but I don't anymore because I use it for so many different things. So what we're going to do is just do your basic thing. Now, do you know what makes mustard yellow? Big question. Hands up if you know what makes mustard yellow. Mom nom, do you know what makes mustard yellow? Because we're going to do that little trick ourselves. Let me get all this mustard seeds off of here. Because you'll notice this doesn't look so yellow, right? But we're going to make it look yellow. So after we have this in, <laughs> no cheating. Okay, I'm going to tell you in three, two, one, turmeric. That's all that makes mustard yellow is turmeric. So once this is done, now we're not going to add our, we're going to add our turmeric when we're over here at this stage, okay? So all we're going to do now, now that the seeds have had a chance to just kind of sit in the water a little bit, get nice and wet, we're going to add our apple cider vinegar. I like to use apple cider vinegar. It's really, it's quite mellow. It doesn't end up uh, adding any extra flavor to the mustard. If you used a wine vinegar, it, it would. It would add a little bit more, but psh, totally might like that, right? Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to add a half a cup of wine vinegar. Okay. So, and you know what? These measurements, don't, don't get fussy about it. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Okay, so I just put my apple cider vinegar in here. So what did we do? We put mustard seeds, we put a little bit of water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Smitten kitten. Did you pop in here? There you are. Yay. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? We're making mustard. Have you ever made mustard? We're going we're enjoying making mustard. Okay, so what did I do? What did I do? We put water first. Just let it soak for a few minutes. Uh, with our mustard seeds, 50-50, I like a 50-50 blend. And then we topped it up with a half a cup of apple cider vinegar. And you know what? That's it. That's all we do. Leave it on the counter for a day or two. And what ends up happening is this. So you can see that the mustard seeds have soaked up the water and the vinegar and has filled this up. If you have really, really fresh mustard seeds, then it'll soak up in a matter of hours. That's it. If after two days, you still got, you know, an inch or so of uh, water or vinegar left pooling, 
you know what you've got stale seeds so you have to go and get new seeds but you can see what's happened with the seeds okay so what happens when we get to this stage now that was I mean let's be serious that was about three minutes of work right take more time yapping than anything okay so we've got our beautiful mustard and I just use a magic bullet okay I mean not a homemade but never have the homemade it before I get paranoid about storing things like that never know how long to store them or to keep them once open well the key here smitten is the fact that m the majority of this is vinegar so it's preserving itself and we put it in the fridge when it's done and this will last well two months really I've usually used mine up that's why I, I make small batches and if I'm down to about here then I'll just make another batch and then that's it so but because it's mostly vinegar it's gonna last it's gonna last don't worry I don't keep my my mustard at uh, room temperature I don't do that okay so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna throw this into my magic bullet now depending on how strong you like it will dictate is dictated by how long you grind it for I just like to give it a quick whirl okay so this is where the turmeric comes in and if you don't want to have it yellow don't have to have it yellow okay but I'm gonna put I don't know maybe between a quarter and a half a teaspoon of turmeric like I say don't worry it's not a big deal and I'm just gonna put a little bit of salt I don't do too much salt because who's there who's there oh nice thanks for hosting thank you so much I put about a quarter of a teaspoon of salt in there and I don't normally put a lot only because whenever I'm using mustard I'm oops usually uh, cooking with it so I have salt in my other food too right okay so put the top on now it's gonna whirl but I'm only doing it for a second so it's not gonna be too hard on you guys okay so literally not much okay give it a good shake now I'll come back over here let's have a look okay so we've got a little bit of color in there you see the color and but my bits are not really ground up very much and like I say if you want it to be hotter you can add more brown seeds than white or yellow you could throw in a few black seeds that'll make it hot 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 um, and you can grind it up more if you want it a little bit sweet add a little bit of sugar remember you're gonna keep this in the fridge so it's no biggie and the majority of this is vinegar no worries so literally I swear to you that is all there is to it so you're gonna take your clean jar oh it's so amazing you're gonna take your clean jar and your lid and then what I do because you know I want to make sure that I know um, when I made it and whatnot is I will take my labels and actually on the website too we have a whole bunch of these labels that are just printable just print them off we have round ones and rectangular ones and whatnot so uh, I you know I don't I don't bother to actually print them off all pretty and everything because <laughs> I'm again inherently lazy <laughs> so what I do is I sit there and I say okay this is my label and I say mustard obvi and then I say September 8 2017 All right and sometimes if I really want to cheat I'll make another label to go on the other side and I say I put the recipe of how to make whatever's in the jar on there so that I don't actually have to go and look it up now the other trick I do because this is just me writing on a piece of paper okay this 
is industrial packing tape that you get at like staples and whatnot. It's the heavy duty stuff you do for when you're moving. So what I do is I use the industrial stuff. There we go. And what this does, it goes right over the entire label. I put it on the jar. Now, oh, and I could have put it on straight if I was actually watching it. The beauty of this is I can wash it. I can wipe it down. Nothing's going to, nothing's coming off of there. Okay. And then when I go to take it off, it comes off nice and clean. I don't get stuck labels. That goes in your fridge. As soon as you're done, throw it in the fridge, which is what I'm going to do. Because now I'm going to have a, a double batch. I have a double batch of mustard. That's awesome. That is awesome. And once you put it in the fridge, basically what's happening is you're stopping. Uh, you're going to allow the flavors to stay as long as possible too. Okay. So uh, experiment with it. Grind it up a little bit hotter. I mean, quite frankly, that... That jar, that entire jar, probably cost about 50 cents to make, I have to guess. So the fact is, use painter tape and a Sharpie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And the only thing I found with using masking tape or anything else like that is that when you're cooking, your hands get dirty and wet and everything, so you mess up your labels. And I don't like to redo my labels, so I just keep my packing tape. And even if I used a piece of masking tape, I would just throw packing tape on top of it all. And then I can wipe it down with a wet cloth, right? So that entire jar costs us about 50 cents. You end up being able to experiment. And you, if you go 50% that plus 50% honey, you have a beautiful, gorgeous honey mustard for cheap, cheap, cheap. And you know what? That's all there is to making mustard. So tomorrow, what's going to happen is I'm going to keep this at room temperature and tomorrow this will have soaked up all the water and all the vinegar. And then I'll just do the same thing. Add a bit of salt, add a bit of turmeric, give it a whirl, put it in the fridge. All done. All done. That's one of my favorite, favorite time savers and money savers because I actually was kind of disappointed that I fell in love with that mustard so much because after I saw the price of it, I just about crap myself and said, are you kidding me? There's no way. And of course, for me, I have um, I have to read every single label because of the additives they put in because I have celiac disease. So I have to figure out how I'm going to make things from scratch without killing me because there's only so many hours in a day, right? And I have to make certain things from scratch, but I don't want to make my life miserable, right? So good, good. Excellent. 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 It's just that easy. You thought it was going to be complicated. I know you did. I know you did. And it's not. Now, when it comes to making American mustard, all you would do is take the mustard and uh, add a bunch more turmeric, add a little bit less vinegar, a little bit more spices, maybe throw in some garlic powder and whatnot, and then whirl it like crazy, like crazy. And, but as long as you're using all white uh, or yellow seeds, it won't be overly strong. That's all there is to it. Now, if you find mustard powder, I have mustard powder here. And if you add, where's my mustard powder? One, two, three. This is mustard powder. If you have mustard powder, you can use this and add water to it to make a paste and then make mustard but you know what when you make mustard from a powder it is way hotter hot 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 so if you really like heat go that way and i know in the uk a lot of times people just make mustard whether it's out of the seeds or the powder and that's just normal it's just that's just what you do so that's mustard too easy okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to our teriyaki sauce now, the teriyaki sauce is my go-to sauce for when uh, everybody is uh, stupid busy. And uh, I want to just do something so, so, so simple. And I will normally make a big, big batch. 
and then I will separate it out into one cup portions because usually for us one cup of sauce does us whether it's for meatballs or chicken wings or drums or whatever seeds etc seem expensive here in UK do you know what <laughs> my mustard minute yes I found the trick actually to buying cheap mustard seeds and I in Canada as well, you you will find that if you go to a regular grocery store and go into the international section, your your little pouch of mustard seeds is going to be about five dollars because it's international. <laughs> so you get to pay a premium for it. If, however, you go to an East Indian grocer or a Middle Eastern grocer then what you're going to find, and I actually found some at Costco too, or a bulk barn, what you're going to find is you can get them dirt cheap because when you're cooking East Indian or Middle Eastern or whatnot, using mustard seed is normal. It's not international. It's not special in order to double, triple, quadruple what you're going to be paying. So I do that when I buy my chickpea flour, when I buy rice. I don't buy rice in a regular grocery store. I buy rice at the Middle Eastern stores and the uh, East Indian stores and things like this, where those kinds of food are just normal. So don't buy them at your regular grocery store, mainstream grocery store. And uh, that is what I found is way 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 cheaper and now too even with things like Amazon you can buy it dirt cheap on Amazon so there is no reason to go to the hoity-toity section of the grocery store don't do that yeah Asian markets work just fine too and anywhere you go where that kind of food is just normal like for us salt and pepper is just normal you're not gonna pay that much money for salt and pepper at our stores so Go to the Asian markets, go to the Middle Eastern, go to the East Indian stores where that kind of stuff is just normal. And you actually find that it's way cheaper, way cheaper. Okay, so let's get on to our teriyaki sauce, which is, again, ridiculously, ridiculously simple. Yeah, Amazon is way, way, way cheaper. Yeah. And the only thing you want to do is don't go bananas and buy huge quantities because by the time you use it up, they're going to be stale. So don't buy massive quantities. Just make it as a regular part of your shopping. And then you will have uh, really fresh stuff and that, that will swell up nicely and beautifully and, and have fabulous, fabulous flavor. Hey, Bob, how's it going? Being in Texas, Mexican food seasonings are super common and it's great. Exactly. Once you can get a handle on where to find what is super common and normal, you know, people like me being up in Canada, if I'm going to buy authentic Mexican, it's going to be more expensive because unless I can find a Mexican grocer here, then it's just normal. How are you? Nice to see you. Okay, we have a question for you. People need to tell me. What is your most favorite, favorite food? If you could only eat one food ever again, what is it going to be? And just a guy, you never told me. I don't think most of you people told me what your favorite food is. So spices actually do freeze really, really well. Just make sure you pull the air out. And I have, I have plenty of bags of frozen spices. So when you get your mustard seed, if you have to buy a big humongous thing, then definitely freeze them, label them, and put the date on them. Ramen. Oh, ramen noodles. Ooh, I miss, I miss ramen noodles, something fierce. Holy bananas. You have too many. Oh, come on. Um, okay, so let's get, let's get happening with this teriyaki because it's too simple and we want to make sure Cozy gets to see this. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a cup. This is just one basic batch. What I would do if I am going to freeze a bunch is I would double or triple this. Okay, so I'm going to use one cup of water. And I'm going to also... <laughs> 
seafood yeah of course seafood yeah there's so much so much yummy food to choose from it's absolutely crazy okay so we're going to use some of our previously homemade i was asked that the other night answer didn't go over well so i'll say pasta italian okay well pasta italian is fantastic too something i can't get often okay you think about that smitten all right okay so what we're going to do is we're going to do a quarter cup of brown sugar because brown sugar is awesome okay we're going to do some soy sauce and i usually do um low sodium and then that way i can also I'll cut down a little bit on uh, the salt and whatever I'm cooking, but it still gives me a little bit of wiggle room as well. Brown sugar. Quarter of a cup or 60 mils of soy sauce. There we go. And we're going to do two cloves. Oh, gee whiz. Sorry about that, guy. Two cloves of garlic. I have taken to just cutting my garlic. It just seems... Mm, it just seems to be working so much better. Now I say two cloves of garlic, but this is this is about a two clover. And we're gonna be cooking this down a little bit so it'll get that rawness out of the garlic. And this actually doing the garlic is the hardest part of this entire recipe. And you could literally have this done in about five minutes. I normally smash my garlic, but these guys are so big and fresh that they don't even actually smash <laughs> it's very weird so all I'm gonna do is give it a nice slice and we're gonna put it in there oh my phone who's calling me who's calling me oh good somebody else answered it yay Nobody usually calls on the landline unless they want to clean my furnace or something. That one of those scams or say that my, my Windows computer is not working properly. Ha 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 ha. Italian. Oh yes. Gnocchi. I love gnocchi. I gotta I rarely make gnocchi, but I have figured out a way to make it where I can eat it. Love it. Love it. Okay, so this is the hardest part. Of making this sauce actually I think that might have been my husband I don't know if it's important somebody will come and get me I'm pretty sure okay so this is as as uh, fine as you need to go quite honestly okay so we're just gonna dump it in okay and again you know what measurements on this are not hard and fast if you like it a little bit extra sweet add a little bit of extra sugar or like the next ingredient we're putting in a little bit of extra honey honey the angels sing honey oh lamb or lobster oh mm -hmm. lamb or lobster that would be awesome i love fresh lamb unfortunately in canada a lot of times we can only get frozen i've got a couple lines on some people who can provide me with fresh lamb but it's it's pretty hard to get so we're going to put a tablespoon of honey in this puppy and if your honey gets um, crystalline like this don't worry about it don't it's not bad it's all good actually honey has a pretty much an indefinite lifespan so it's not a problem I had my honey in mm, in some warm water because it was all crystally because I buy it by the boatload so lobster at Christmas usually frozen too yeah I don't hmm, I can't remember the last time I had lobster we had we had a lobster here actually one time and it was still alive and we let it walk around on the floor oh my gosh it was terrible the poor dog was freaking out Okay, so now we're also going to do some minced garlic. Now, I just bought a new beautiful thing of garlic. So what's going to happen here is this is just going to pop into the freezer. I, pop, I usually only deal with frozen garlic. I throw it literally 
in a freezer bag and chuck it in the freezer. And then I will saw off a piece that I want. And when I go to, if I need to do the rasp with my uh, ginger, it, it grates way better when it's frozen. This gets all stringy and it's hard to deal with when it's actually fresh. But when you're dealing with um, frozen, it's awesome. And then what I do is I buy beautiful fresh ginger and then I don't, I don't take the skin off. I don't do anything. It just goes straight into the freezer. And usually what I'll do is I'll just use a little, a spoon, the back end of a spoon to uh, take the skin off. But when I freeze it, I'll, I'll scrub it down really good. And then I will um, dry it really well throw it skin and all, and when I cook with that frozen ginger, I don't even skin it. I don't take the skin off or anything. And it is fantastic that way. Didn't the Egyptians put honey? Yeah, absolutely, and you know what, it's still good. It's absolutely still good. No, it, well, it's not raw honey, it's the regular honey, but all honey will crystallize, and uh, it just does that, it just does that. So, but don't, I, I hear a lot of people that throw out their honey thinking it's no good anymore. No, it's it's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, so that, the little, this is the ginger, right? Did I say garlic? Uh, it's the ginger, right? That's the ginger. And I, I throw the ginger in the freezer, okay? So I want about a half a teaspoon of ginger. So I'm just going to slice it the same way. I do with the garlic. I'm not going to get all fussy with it and mince it really, really small. And it's usually, well, you know, I like it gingery. And of course, fresh ginger is much sweeter than dried ground ginger. And if you only have dried ground ginger, just make sure you use about a third as much because ground dried spices are three times as strong as fresh. So if I'm looking at a quarter of a, or half a teaspoon, you're, you're just gonna need a pinch of ground dried ginger. That's all you need. See, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a bit more in here. And fresh ginger makes it taste cooler, whereas Dried ginger makes it taste a little bit warmer. And it just depends on your taste preference. This is gonna be a little bit more than a quarter of a teaspoon, but that's because we enjoy it very, very gingery. And so the beauty of this is you make it as garlicky or gingery or sweet as you like. So usually what I say is follow the recipe the way it's written first and then make adjustments. And then once you get nail it down to what's your favorite way of doing it, then uh, write it down and work with that. So these guys are just gonna get chucked into the freezer. Ah, thanks for the follow, Bob. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. You can never go wrong adding ginger or garlic to anything. Ah, uh, absolutely not. I would, when I normally start a dish with, um, you know, sauteing some ginger or garlic, I will usually add um, garlic and ginger and onions. Always, always, always. Okay, so all we're going to do, that's it. Aside from all the yakking, it took about two minutes. So we're just going to heat this up in order to melt off the honey. Let's put this here and let's put it on the small element. We're going to bring this puppy to a boil just to melt and dissolve the sugar and the honey. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add our cornstarch to thicken it. So in the UK, cornstarch is like corn flour. It's the thickener that I use. I don't use flour, not, not corn flour. It is cornstarch. And I usually make a slurry so you notice actually this is something i do a lot in my kitchen is let's just see here there we go 
I have labels on my jars that say what I use this for. So this says cornstarch slurry. So for every one cup of soup, stew, or sauce, use one tablespoon of cornstarch and one tablespoon of cold water. Whisk together well and add to boiling liquid. So that I always know what's in the jar and how to use whatever's in the jar. And if somebody comes in my kitchen and they're not familiar with my kitchen, then it's easy for them as well. So what I'm gonna do, get my little measure spoon. Get my little measure spoon. And I tend to do that with everything because I also take everything out of their packaging. So like when I have my oats and things, I have or rice, I always have the cooking instructions. I put it on the label and use the tape and, and uh, it works out really, really well that way. Okay, so we're going to use a tablespoon of cornstarch. There we go. You can get out of the way. A tablespoon of cornstarch, mix it in with a bit of water. Bob's your uncle. And get some. Yeah, there's nothing worse than when somebody else comes in your kitchen and you know, especially if they're there to help out and then all it is is nothing but question, question, questions, or they end up putting things in the wrong place and that can be irritating. Yeah, that can, that can. And the thing is people who come in my kitchen know that I have to be so careful and so I can't have anything contaminate anything. So all of my stuff are in jars and uh, it's quite funny when somebody comes to the house and just sees cupboards full of jars. So that's going to be good there. We're just going to have this thing, this sauce come to a boil. And literally the only thing we're going to do is thicken it. And that's our teriyaki sauce. It's got the sweetness. Uh, it's got the acidity. Oh, you know what? It does not have the acidity because I did not put my red wine vinegar. We're going to put half a teaspoon of red wine vinegar and that will give it the acidity that we need. The sweetness, the saltiness, the uh, garlic, the ginger, all of that will come together. And then of course, if you like heat, 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 then yeah, add your favorite heat to it. That's fine too. This is just your basic, basic sauce that you can build on. Add more garlic, take out the ginger, do whatever you like. But the reality is, this is a heat and go sauce. And if you, let's say you tripled this recipe and if you're only cooking for one, you're gonna need like a quarter of a cup of the sauce for each meal. You're gonna end up with six meals worth of sauce. And it just works like a charm. And to buy that in the grocery store is so expensive. And I would not, I would not put this in a jar and, and leave it in the fridge. I would just portion it out and freeze it and lay it flat on a cooker sheet in, in um, bags. And then it'll freeze flat. And then you just have a stack load of, of these little bags of sauce. And then that way too, you don't have to worry about it finding these jars in the fridge going, oh, this is good. Oh God, I waited too long and then now it's rotten and that was a waste of time and ingredients. No, I don't, I don't do that. It just works out better this way. So sometimes what I'll do is if I'm making a batch of meatballs, I'll form a bunch of meatballs, put those into a container and then have the sauce on the side so that when I take the meatballs out, I have the sauce and then it all comes together just beautifully. Too, too easy. Weeknight meal, late night meal, whatever, right? And the point is to make it quick and easy and not to break the bank. And once you learn how to make a basic teriyaki sauce, that really opens things up to lots of other meals. And it, it actually is a really good introduction to making really nice sauces at home. And then you want, when, you, when you see recipes, you understand what it is they're actually doing with their sauce. You can see the acid element. You can see the sweet element and the salty element. You could definitely can it, absolutely. It just depends on how much you're gonna need to use, right? Because even for the like three adults, when I make meatballs, I'm only gonna need about a half a cup of sauce for the three of us. So 
unless you have it where you're going to use a teriyaki at least once a week, because in the fridge this would last about probably easily a uh, couple of weeks. I mean, because homemade doesn't have the shelf life, right? But if you figure, if you make even half big batches, but only do like a half a cup and, and jar that in the smaller jars, then yeah, you could take one out every couple of weeks and then, then you're cooking with steam too, right? Definitely, especially in those little jam or jelly jars, that would work really well. And it really depends on what your storage situation is. If you've got more freezer storage, like I say, you freeze it in the bags and lay them flat and they take a, I have a freezer, an upright freezer that has soups and stews and everything just lined up and, uh, you know, it can fit eight or nine frozen bits of uh, packages of soup in a really small area and it works like a charm. So once this comes to the boil, then what we're going to do is we're going to add our cornstarch and you know what? going to be done. I freeze quite a lot of sauces too, usually barbecue, tomato or pasta. Absolutely works like a charm and it's always there. Boom. Always there. You don't have to worry about like if you're going to do ribs or something and you've uh, frozen a barbecue sauce. It's so, so good and it saves you so much time. Is that thunder? I don't know. We got massive storms going through the area. It doesn't know what it wants to do. Okay, so yeah, I like to have lots of sauces on hand and sometimes I will, you know, just staple together the sauce and the protein and they go together in the freezer and then they're ready, ready for whenever I need it. And I always, I also freeze uh, already made rice. So you can make a little package of a package of rice and a package of meatballs and a package of teriyaki sauce, staple them together or put them, bind them together stick them in the freezer and that's a, that's an entire meal and you've saved a whole lot of money because a little jar of teriyaki sauce it's going to cost you three four dollars when you're using maybe 35 30 cents worth of ingredients yeah for chili that works really awesome for chili yeah that would be awesome hey have your own cook-off yeah my husband is a massive chili fan but he's He's like ghost pepper hot chili and I don't I don't do much um, in the way of hot and spicy it, it just doesn't get along with me very well but uh, we love our chili love 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 our chili and even um, I do I also do a cabbage roll chili and because I really miss cabbage rolls but I make a chili that taste exactly like cabbage rolls. And if anybody knows cabbage rolls, oh, it's so good. So that is our, our go-to for winter time. Cabbage roll chili, um, baked beans, regular chili. Yeah, we really like that. And I always, always make extra and then lay it flat in the bags and freeze it and then because even my son today, he was going to have some lunch. And I was like, well, we got rabbit stew in the fridge, in the freezer. Just thaw it out. The nice thing about chili is that if people want them spicier, it's easy to make them hotter per bowl. Yeah, cabbage rolls are awesome. Winter's coming. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's my feeling too. Everyone in my family likes a different heat level for their uh, soups and stews and chilies. So yeah, you heat it per bowl. I make a baseline, just foundational chili, and then they get to adjust it however they like. And it just it just works great that way. And then everybody's happy. Okay, this is almost at the boil. Let's, uh, let's see where our steam come. There it is. There it is. So what's happening, the reason that we're cooking this off is just to take the rawness off the garlic and the ginger and to really help infuse the flavors into the base sauce melt the sugar and the honey and uh, and then of course we're going to just give it a quick thicken and the, the reality is too if you didn't want to thicken it right here you don't have to 
but uh, I like to put the thickener in now and then I don't worry about it at all once it comes time to actually use the sauce. I'm going to make chili tonight now to freeze when I cook in a bit. Got mints to use. Ah, oh, yeah, mints. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. My husband's used um, um, actual steak. He likes to use steak in his too. I like mints. I, I like to make it with mints and I just make your basic chili. And then freeze a whole boatload of it so that I can have it whenever I want to. And then if you're coming home late or whatever, you forgot to take something out for supper, it's not an issue. You just pull out one of these guys, heat it up, done. Okay, so we're going to add our cornstarch because we've got ourselves going to a boil. And literally this will take about 30 seconds. And you just let it, let it boil with the cornstarch and it will thicken. And you can use this as your, your sauce for your stir fries too. I mean, there's just so much you can use this for. It's, it's crazy. And it never, it's never going to look the same. You could probably put it in three different meals in a week and it would not look the same. Okay. So I'm just going to let this come back up to a boil. Can be pork, turkey, or lamb. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mince. Ah, okay. Yeah. Cozy. Cozy, you're from Texas, right? Because they, I don't think, yeah, mince would not be a thing, or at least it wouldn't be called mince in Texas. Yeah, it's just any, basically any ground meat. Really. Okay. So, this has thickened up, and we'll take it off the heat so you can actually see that it has thickened. Okay. Oh, so nice and thick. Okay. Oh, let's get the steam out of here, and we're going to actually, we'll let it cool off a bit. And I'm going to put half of that in a, in a jar or half of that in a bag and half of it's going to go for our supper tonight. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you're in California. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. That's, that's mince. It's just basically ground meat really is all it is. Okay. So what have we done? We've done the teriyaki sauce. Literally let this cool. If you're going to put it on chicken, I would oven roast the chicken. Let's just say you're oven roasting it. However you're doing it, barbecuing it. In the last five minutes, you would add the sauce because the sauce is already cooked. It's already thickened. You can put it under the grill to get it all caramelized really, really nice. If you're doing a stir fry, just in the last two minutes, you add your sauce, just like any other sauce. That's it. And you will have some whenever you want a basic teriyaki. It's so, so, so good. Right, right. Okay, so we did mustard. We did teriyaki sauce. Too simple. I told you it's going to be simple. Simple, simple. And like I say, I'll put the, the printable recipes. They're all printable on the uh, Discord. So just come and print them off. Just print them off. Easy, easy peasy. Okay, I'm going to actually get this into the freezer so that it's out of the way and I'm going to label it with today's date because I know I have I have some other ginger in the freezer but I just wanted to I saw this at the grocery store and uh, I wanted to pick it up because it was so nice and soft or plump and juicy Let's see how well I can write on a label after I got my ginger in there. Okay, September 8, 2017. There we go. Okay, and literally, I'm just putting it in the freezer. Literally. And actually, once it's frozen, I will go back and I'll suck out more of the air out of it. So, 
That's what we're doing. Water, brown, sugar, and discord. Yay! Yup. Yup, yup. I'm going to try to put all the recipes on the discord just so you can print it straight from there. Some of the information, though, um, you can find on the website, too, because, like, I have a whole information article about mustard. So you want to learn more about mustard, you know, all these things. Uh, if you want to learn more about... Uh, the brown sugar for the type of molasses and stuff like this. I have a, an entire article all about that kind of stuff. So, secret ingredient is definitely this cord. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to make some ricotta cheese. I don't know if anybody here has made their own cheese. Cheese, please. But... I find that whenever I want to use anything like ricotta, I use it so, so rarely that to go to the grocery store and buy a tub of ricotta is ridiculous. It's so expensive and it is ridiculous. So what I do now is I will make my own ricotta and, well, you can hear my little refrigerator alarm. Ugh. And the other thing is, I can make, yes, we get our milk in bags. Hi, huh, everybody laugh at the people who get their milk in bags. No, the ricotta, texture of ricotta, it depends. See, the beauty of making it yourself is you get to decide what the texture is going to be. And I always had, actually, my son always had a problem with the texture of ricotta. But when I make it, I make it creamier. And you can decide on how dry or creamy your ricotta is going to be. And the other thing you can do is you can, when you drain it, you drain so much water or the way out of it and you press it and you make pressed cheese like paneer. And then what you do is you grill it or you deep fry it. Pan grilling or grilling outside is always so, so yummy. And <laughs> mix in a bag. <laughs> but the fact is, Paneer, which is an East Indian uh, cheese that is a pressed cheese that they put in a lot of curry and things like this, is basically just this process, but you weight it down and press it so that it holds its shape. And then you cut it. But the ricotta is the simplest, and the creaminess of the ricotta is dictated by how long you drain it. So if you don't like the dry, crumbly texture, that you find in stores sometimes, then you're only going to drain it for a whole five minutes. That's it. And it'll be nice and creamy and lovely. So the and the, the ricotta recipe I have, it just takes two cups of milk. Now you're only going to get a quarter of a cup of ricotta out of the deal. But in a lot of cases, you don't need that much ricotta. You, maybe you're just making ravioli or something and you don't want to have to have an entire tub of ricotta well that's cool you can you can dic you can decide how much ricotta you make because we need two ingredients okay we need we need milk and we need vinegar or lemon juice i use vinegar because it's cleaner what's a horrible ratio Explain what you're talking about, Cozy. A horrible ratio. Hmm. Okay. Uh, two cups for... Well, of course it is. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're ending up getting a very small amount. But what's happening is the, in making the cheese, you're just taking the proteins, the curds, out of the whey. And there's a lot more whey than there is curds. Right? So, I mean, you can use the whey uh, when you're making bread or if you're making pancakes, you can use the whey in place of water. So you're not going to waste it, right? But that's part of the reason why um, it can be so pricey in the store to buy it. But if you actually want it at home, you don't have to worry about it. It is very cheap to make. And I'm actually not even using whole milk. I'm using 2%, which is even cheaper. So... And, and the thing is, whenever I've had to buy ricotta, normally what ends up happening is uh, I have to buy this 250 ml container of ricotta because it doesn't come any, any smaller than that. 
So you're getting a cup of ricotta. All I needed was, uh, you know, half a cup or a quarter of a cup. And I'm not making that same recipe for dog's age after that. So it, it all goes to waste. At least this way I can spend 35 cents, 50 cents, to make my own. I use a couple tea way. Oh yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Cheap and lazy are two great things. Yep, cheap and lazy. I only see milk in bags at coffee shops. Easier to pour with a jug, I guess. Yeah, you know what? We have an ongoing joke in Canada because in the east, where I am, well, central, we have our milk in bags. And in the West, where I moved from, you only find milk in jugs. So, and I remember when I was a kid having, oh, my scissors suck. There we are. Um, I remember as a kid when I lived out here that I would get my milk in bags. And then when I moved out West, it was like, oh, that's right. They don't do milk in bags here. So it's, yeah, it's funny. I don't know why they do milk in bags here, but they do. Oops. Yeah, and it is easier to pour from a jug than it is a damn bag when you got to cut the plastic. Usually you have a funky little tool where you just slice it, but you know what? And it clips onto the thing, but you end up losing it. Whatever. Okay. So, this is what we're going to do. I'm, oh, here we are. So these are the tools that you're going to need. Milk was in udders. Well, it normally is. Okay, so the cheese making process in this case. This is not a cheese that you end up uh, adding rennet to or anything like this, okay? And this is not a traditional ricotta. Ricotta is twice cooked. So what ricotta normally is, is you make the cheese, you take the whey, you, you recook the whey and take any extra proteins out of the whey. That is twice cooked ricotta. Modern ricotta is we just take the proteins from the fresh milk. That's it. Okay. So no, it's not a traditional ricotta, but it's basically it works out the same way. So I don't use cheesecloth. I just use an old bed sheet. 100% cotton bed sheet that I tore up into pieces because cheesecloth is way, way, way expensive. So all I do is I have a fine mesh strainer and I put that on there. And then when I'm done with it, I give it a wash, put it through the laundry and Bob's your uncle. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our milk and we're going to heat it to between 165 and 185 degrees. As long as you have it in that window, all's gonna be good. Maybe the French influence, perhaps, perhaps. So you could heat this on the stove, and I've done it before on the stove, or you can do it in the microwave. I'm gonna do it in the microwave because quite frankly, it's gonna take about, uh, it's going to take between two and four minutes in the microwave. And the thing I like about doing it in the microwave is you don't have to worry about scorching it in the pan. So we're going to do two, two minutes at a time. And there was a while there I didn't even have a microwave. And so I would just do it on the stove. And that's not a big... big hey, Blues Music, how are you? Nice to see you. Cheesecloth is stupid expensive. I know, right? And then you lose half your cheese or half your whatever you're making. So I make my own yogurt too. And I always just, I have a stack of, of these cloths because it's not terry cloth. It doesn't have uh, fuzz or anything like this. It's just a bed sheet. So I just tear it up and I use it and then I don't have to worry about cheesecloth. I find it insane how much they charge for cheesecloth. And then you say, put four or five layers and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, no, I don't think so. No, not into that. So like I say, you don't have to be too funky about the temperature as long as it's above 165. Between 165 and 185, we're gonna use our handy dandy thermometer. 
<laughs> it's like a seasoned cheesecloth. Well, not quite seasoned though, because you wash it after every time. And you make sure you don't do it in laundry with, you know, um, what is it, dryer sheets or whatever, you know. And uh, so what I'll do is I'll just run, I'll wash it in the sink, I'll run boiling water through it, and then run it through the, the washing machine. That's what I do. So in I do the, the milk for two minutes at a time and I give it a quick little stir in between and then test the temperature. Um, and as long as, uh, there's some people who are saying hard and fast 180 degrees, but uh, it can be anywhere between 165 and 185. And for my microwave, it takes about three minutes, between three and four minutes. Because right now, after two minutes, I'm already at 143. So I'm going to do it for another minute 30. And then you will see the magic happen. So what do you do? The pun, of course it did. Died, 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 died. Um... What do you do with ricotta cheese? You put it in ravioli, you put it in um, any kind of stuffed pasta, you put it in lasagna. <laughs> you put it in all that kind of jazz. And actually, what we like to do is we, uh, because I don't like it all grainy and dry, put it on crackers, uh, add honey or marmalade, or do it savory and add olive oil and salt and pepper. You know, you can do all manner of stuff with it. And it'll keep in the fridge. Uh, it kind of maxes out uh, at five days, really. You don't want to keep it more than five days. So, but again, I don't, I don't make massive, massive ba batches of this stuff. You know, you can freeze this as long as it's in a recipe, but it doesn't freeze so great on its own. So... Uh, if you're making raviolis and you freeze the raviolis with the cheese in the raviolis, it's cool. But if you're just going to take the brick of or the the bowl of of uh, ricotta, the texture gets kind of funky. So I don't like to do that. Okay, so let's. See what our temperature's at here. Okay. There we go. Okay. So definitely we're at one eighty. We're at one eighty five. Okay, so for two cups. Of milk, you're just going to use two tablespoons of vinegar. Easy peasy. Easy, easy peasy. And where's our little guy here? Here we are. Okay. So, we're going to have our little strainer ready. And actually, I think I'm going to use different bowl have our little bowl ready okay so we're gonna take our two tablespoons of vinegar and then one oops and two. So I use vinegar because lemon can tend to add a, leave a lemony taste in the ricotta. Okay, so just leave it there for, just for a few seconds. Just let it do its thing. So vinegar tends to not leave such a, a, a strong uh, taste like lemon. But if you're going to use ricotta for something sweet, then definitely use lemon. That's cool too. That's not a problem either. So you can see... It's starting to curdle. 
And this part is not very attractive, I'll tell you. It really is not very attractive. Now, if you find that it's not curdling very quickly, then you can go ahead and add extra acid. Okay, there we are. So, it's doing its thing. We're going to put our sieve and our cloth over top of our bowl. And we're going to gently pour this puppy into okay so you can see the curds have separated this is where you're going to dictate the texture of your ricotta you can strain this for as long well up to an hour let's call it up to an hour because if i'm going to press it to make it flat uh like paneer then you want to press it for about an hour and you just, I would just wrap this up and and put it between two two plates and maybe put a pot a cast iron pan on top of it so it could weight it down and then wait an hour and unwrap it all and then you have this beautiful um, pressed cheese so if you if you wanted it really really creamy you would just give it literally a quick drain if you want it to be more crumbly, then you would let it sit for about five minutes, but not very long. And we're not making much. So the thing is, this is, a, this is great for in a pinch when you want to have a nice fresh ricotta for a recipe or for on crackers or for when company comes and you just want to put it in a bowl, drizzle a little bit of olive oil and salt and pepper on there. You put it on in a nice little bowl with some crackers around it and then they can use it to dip into. Oops. Could you throw herbs in there if you want before or after you heat? Good question. Actually, what you can do easily, you can do it either way, okay? You can put it in the milk and heat it that way. And then once you drain it, you're not going to lose your herbs. It's going to stay with the curds. So, like, my son likes to make a lemon dill version. So he'll use vinegar, or not vinegar, lemon juice. And he will add dill and some garlic, dried garlic powder to the milk. Heat it all up and then do the draining and it's all infused with dill and garlic and it's beautiful. And, or you can do it afterwards as well. If you wanted to do some, if you're concerned about scorching the dill, you can always add fresh dill after the fact. That works perfect too. And you can add a squeeze of lemon, blah, blah, blah. It works, it looks, it works really, really well either way. That's really all ricotta is, is curdled milk. That's it. <laughs> it doesn't sound very pleasant. But yeah, that's all ricotta is. And of course, while well, this being the modern ricotta, of course, right? And quite frankly, that's all it is in traditional. It's just you're taking all of the extra, any leftover curds or proteins from the whey that was used in the cheese making out. So if we have a look see if you can see this let's pull this up to see where our yeah see there we are look at how much whey we've got in there see garlic dill awesome yeah and he'll put it on fish now don't sit here and start squeezing the heck out of this okay be gentle because if you want your curds to be uh, tender don't squeeze them. Just let it naturally drip away, okay? But look at all that whey, all right? And you could probably add more acid and still get more uh, proteins and curd out of that. <laughs> we get ripped off at the store a lot. We absolutely do. That seriously, it was milk and vinegar, you know? So it's like, come on, right? So what I'm going to do is I like to have a more tender uh, ricotta, okay? And no, it does not make much, but sometimes you only need a little bit. And you can make a lot more than that if you like. I mean, really, right? So I'm going to just put it in this little tiny bowl. See how short I am? Just a guy. I 
can't get up into my cupboards without my stool. <laughs> but if you wanted to have a really nice spicy one, absolutely, you could add some cayenne pepper. Oh, and it would, uh, it would make it nice and hot. So you can, you can uh, drain this for, you know, if you drained it for 20 minutes, it would be more of that, the store-bought uh, dryer. The, the more you drain it, the drier it'll be, okay? So let's just have a look here. See, where are we? Can you see? That's all it is, guys. That's all, all it is. So then, let's just. And the thing is, when you're making ravioli, you really literally only need like a quarter of a cup. See, and it just, it just falls off of your cloth, okay? And uh, ravioli and stuff like that, literally, you need a quarter of a cup. That's it. So if I wanted to, you could eat this nice and warm with some marmalade and some, or some honey drizzled on top. <laughs> Are these not the coolest Crocs ever? I mean, come on, right? I mean, I'm, I'm walking on tiles. I gotta, I, I have my, my, um, what is that called? The mat that's kind of cushy but I don't have that mat, cushy mat over here. So, and I have, I have, I've toasted my back. I have a really bad back, so I couldn't actually stand for any length of time without my Crocs. So not, not a cool fashion statement, but whatever. So there is your ricotta, plain and simple. And the more you drain it, the more dry and crumbly it will be. But this is really, really tender. So if you wanted to make it really smooth too, take a whisk and just, mix it and it'll end up being smoother like a, almost like a cream cheese but there's no flavor so it takes any flavor you want function over fashion honey is awesome um savory of course goes good too olive oil with salt and pepper any kind of seasonings you like and then you know store it in the fridge and it's too, too easy. But your friends, okay, if you want to act like you're all hoity-toity, oh man, you sit there and put that on, on the table with a little drizzle of olive oil, salt and pepper. And say, oh, it's nothing. It's just a homemade ricotta. Just feel free to dip it into your, with your crackers and whatnot. Oh yeah, they'd think you were, you slaved forever. Meanwhile, it took you five minutes, literally, not a word of a lie, five minutes. So, what have we made? Mustard, teriyaki sauce, homemade ricotta cheese, mind blown. And it's all that easy. So yeah, feel free to season your ricotta. You could even uh, do a, if you did like caramelized onions and added ricotta and then, like you could make your own. There's a lot of dips out there that have ricotta as a base as well, you know so much and the beauty of ricotta is you can heat ricotta without it melting all ooey and gooey because in some applications you don't want ricotta to get ooey and gooey you just you know and you can put it we put it in salads too we just crumble it on the salads and if we have uh olive oil and lemon dressing or whatnot it, it goes really really well too simple don't get ripped off anymore at the stores and like i say you can keep the whey just put the whey in the fridge and then the next time, uh, the way will keep about a week as well. I mean, let's not be silly about this, right? Keep the way for a week. And so when I'm going to go and make um, pancakes or something, I'll substitute a little bit of the way for uh, another liquid. So if I'm going to use some milk, I might put half whey and half milk. If I were to make bread, then I would use the whey in the bread making. Simple. Okay. So I think we did all our savories. I think it's time to get on to some sweet, 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 sweet things. Okay, so we've got, let's get the, let's get the hot chocolate made because winter's coming, right? And all of these, um, 
stores that offer hot chocolate mixes that have all those additives and garbage in them. Hang on, give me two seconds. Thought I heard somebody at the door, but alas, no. Okay, so we're just going to let this cool over here. And this cloth is going to get washed. So here's our sauce, okay? Beautiful and thick sauce. It's almost cooled down, and we're just going to... I'm going to use half of it for tonight's supper. And the other half is going to get put into bags. So hot chocolate, let's get on to the topic of hot chocolate. How come it is when you try to make hot chocolate at home with cocoa powder, uh, you go to make it and the cocoa powder does not dissolve and it ends up being a funky old mess and then you sit there and say, well, I guess I don't have a choice. I have to buy it at the store. Well, no, I will tell you why it's not working. So, what we're going to do, hot chocolate mix is three ingredients. We've moved up from two ingredients to three ingredients. That's all. And we have our handy dandy jar, naturally. And on this jar, I have how to make the recipe for the mix. So what we're going to do... is put that over there hot chocolate mix is basically a two to one ratio of icing sugar to natural cocoa <laughs> three what three ingredients well, yeah we got three ingredients we got salt icing sugar and cocoa powder that's all there is to hot chocolate um you know the type of stuff that's all nice and sweet already and everything if you want to go and and be um if you just want to use hot cocoa it can be a bit bitter and then what you end up doing is adding sweetener to it so what we're going to do is we're going to put the sweetener in it already now icing sugar north america style is ground fine confectioner sugar that's that's what it is and if you don't have icing sugar, then use a magic bullet or a blender or whatever and grind up your sugar. Because if you're using regular uh, sugar, then you're going to find it's more difficult for it to dissolve. Okay, so it's a three to one ratio. So we're going to use one cup or 120 grams. And I'm actually going to use my scale because it's just way less messy. And we're going to do a figure out I'll let you know the trick to making sure that it dissolves fine okay so we're going to do 120 grams of cocoa which is about a cup okay so see and I'll what do we got here? I got it. So one, two, and again, you don't have to be four. That's one. You don't have to be really accurate. Three. And a bit more. One. There we go. Okay. So if you want to do this by the cup, you can, but I like to have a jar load of it so that it's. It's ready whenever we are. So it's basically a two to one ratio of cocoa to icing sugar. And then of course, you're gonna put some salt because you need salt in things. The salt will bring out the flavors of the chocolate and you need about a teaspoon of salt. So this again, your basic, basic hot chocolate recipe. When it comes time to making your hot chocolate, you can add a bit of cayenne. If you like a zingy hot chocolate, you can add some booze. You can add vanilla. You can add instant coffee to make like a mocha. 
you could add the the instant coffee to this mix and i would say if you're going to make a jar load you probably want to have like a teaspoon of gr grind up your instant coffee a little bit more too right and then you can have a mocha mix you can have a vanilla you can add a bit of mint if you like your cocoa like that okay but this is just your basic foundation recipe so we're going to take another bowl and the key here is to put it through a sieve now you can either use one of these guys or one of these guys but the key is we want to get the mixture uh, get it mixed throughout really really well okay and the the cocoa can tend to get clumpy and this will make sure that it's all mixed together and incorporated really really well so I'm just going to use this guy and like my uh, what I also like to do is I'll make um, whipped cream ahead of time and then just freeze blobs of whipped cream onto parchment paper. And when it comes time to have my hot chocolate, I'll make my hot chocolate and then throw one of these uh, whipped cream scoops onto it. And it will melt as I'm drinking my hot chocolate. And it won't just all, I don't know, sometimes it just gets all combined right at the beginning and you end up not having really any whipped cream at the end it's just all one big mass so I do that and that's really good for using up whipped cream if you you know around the holidays and you have just a little bit of whipped cream left just make your whipped cream and then dollop it onto parchment paper put it in the freezer and then whenever you have hot chocolate you will have whipped cream for your hot chocolate it's all good all right, so I'm gonna just put that there. And Ashley, you know what? This step is really, really important. It actually makes a huge difference in making really creamy hot chocolate. So don't skip it. Even if you have to use, just use the the little mesh strainer. That's fine too. I think your son would love making this. Just a guy. This would be so much fun to make. I like to do that with my compound butter for steaks. Absolutely. Yeah, it works fabulous. See, because you can see there's clumps in there, you know, and it's really hard to get rid of the clumps. There we go. All right. So what we've got here, here we are, is we've got this beautiful, beautiful hot chocolate give it a stir so this the trick is you're gonna do two to three tablespoons of mix per cup of milk or water and because we we mixed it all up and we put it through the sieve it's actually going to dissolve really really well so I'm going to actually um, my wife loves hot chocolate in the winter. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you uh, making up a cup of hot chocolate and how to do it so that um, it is smooth and yummers. So what we're going to do is we're going to only heat a quarter of a cup of milk to begin with. Actually, I'm going to heat the whole thing up. Um, and I'm going to do it, I'm going to show you how to do it so that you get the ultimate creamy hot chocolate. And I might as well do it in a see-through thing so that you can actually see what it is we're doing. So, we're going to heat our milk. I like it for two, between two and three minutes. Um, so while that's doing, let's transfer this into here. So you can put the directions so that you don't have to look it up again, what the ratio is. Stick it into your jar. You can also put the directions for, you know, how to make your hot chocolate, I guess. Two to three tablespoons per cup. 
and yeah because too when you go to the store and you see how much of the mix you're gonna, you can buy this big jar and then you're like oh my gosh i have to use so much and this this darn jar cost me five dollars you're kidding me right well that's because they they fill it full of icing sugar too and that's why it's so 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 good but like at Christmas time, your guests, if you're going to have people over for Christmas, you go to the store and you buy those um, uh, candy cane sticks. You make the hot chocolate, stick a candy cane in it, and then they end up with this lovely chocolate mint hot chocolate. And it looks all festive and maybe and put top it with some whipped cream and whatever. And uh, it'll be very impressive. Very impressive. Water, chocolate, gross. Has to be milk. Of course it has to be milk. Uh, I don't have it much, so luxury or nothing. Absolutely. For those people who are either allergic to, to dairy, I mean, it's an option that you do it with water, but I figure, I mean, since I can eat dairy, right, uh, then I just do it with milk, of course. So then there you go. It's all set. And then once you get down to about here, just make some more. And it makes quite a bit. It'd be about 10, 10, 10 cups of uh, hot chocolate. So what we like to do, uh, depends on where, oh, here it is. Okay. You can either use a little, tile, a little whisk or use one of these funky guys. There we are. So let's get a lovely little guy like that. Cup so you can see what's actually happening. Now, if you were to do this with normal cocoa, it ends up being very difficult to get it all dissolved. But because we sifted it and it's so light, it's amazing, it's so light. So because we sifted it and we're using um, icing sugar, it's, it's going to dissolve just fine. So you put about a quarter of a cup. That's it. A quarter of a cup. And then you either use a whisk or use one of these little guys. I'm trying these guys at the dollar store all the time now. There we go. So it's going to be really thick. Okay, don't don't try to dump all your milk at one time. And then you fill it almost all the way up. Give it a little stir. And then you take the leftover milk. And if you're not going to use whipped cream, then you just froth up your milk a little bit. These little machines are actually really good. We've had this one for like five years, six years. Now you notice in my hot chocolate, it's not, um, <clears throat> it's not grainy. Let's have a look over here. There we are. It's nice and thick. It's not grainy. It didn't all pool to the bottom. It mixed in completely. And then we just put a little bit of, where's my little, there is. There we go. And then you get your little bit of milk and you can put a little bit of cocoa on the top. And it's so creamy and so good and there's zero zero reason to buy it at the store don't do it anymore just make sure you've got some icing sugar and you can use natural cocoa you can use uh dutch process cocoa the dutch process will be a little bit less acidic a little bit more bitter so if you don't want it quite so sweet but you want that extra lightness from the um, icing sugar you can use dutch process that works really really well sometimes i do that and then you stick this in the cupboard bob's your uncle all done no more wasting money on store-bought and it again is yet another one of those ones that really honestly without all the yapping going on 
takes two minutes, five minutes to put together. All right? Oh, it's so creamy and thick and really, really, really good. Your wife would love that and your son would really enjoy making that. And he can do all the sifting and everything like that. Be very, very cool. He would really enjoy that. So that, and, and again, make sure you can, you can add a little bit of vanilla. You can add um, spice to it. All of that. Whatever you like to make it your own. Add some Baileys to it. That would be good. Um, add some coffee liqueur or instant coffee. That works too. And at Christmas time too, you can get you can get the cocoa and the icing sugar on dirt cheap because everything's on sale for baking. Works like a charm. Okay, again, look at how quick that was. Okay, should we get on to the brown sugar? Just a guy. Is it killing you yet? Let's get on to the brown sugar. Why don't we? Okay, let's get the heavy machinery out. Now, to do this, you need either a hand mixer or a stand mixer. It's, it's like a requirement, okay? Um, and I'm just wondering, I want you guys to be able to see what's actually happening inside the mixer. And I think being on the stove might actually be better. Let's just have a boo here. Okay, so miraculously, this uh, recipe is actually following a trend. The trend of today is minimal ingredients. This one has two ingredients. So happy. And I have to say that this is my favorite DIY ever because... Whenever I bought brown sugar at the grocery store, <laughs> whenever I bought brown sugar at the grocery store, I always end up having to buy one of those little brown things to stick in the brown sugar to keep it moist or put an apple slice or put a piece of bread or something because nine times out of 10, it ends up hard before I've used it all, even within the same week. And secret, 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 the reason for that is because the brown sugar that you buy in the store is freaking old. It's old and it's stale before you even get it. So, brown sugar is nothing more than white sugar and molasses. It does not, oh it does, look at that, well, see you and I, <laughs> we're both not quite awake. Well, there you go. People will sit there and say, oh, beef stew. That looks really interesting. And it's so not. <laughs> Let me see if I can't just give that a fix. Wow. Good catch. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's just say D-I-Y. Bliss. Let's just call it that. Yay. Okay, molasses and sugar. That's it. That's all there is to it. And the ratio is very simple. Two cups of white sugar to two tablespoons of molasses. Unless you want it darker, then add more molasses. Simple as that. And I've gotten to a point now where, because again, 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 measurement is not critical here, okay? I've gotten to a point now where my son laughs at me because I just dump and go, okay? So let's make sure that you can see exactly what's going on. There we go, because the stove is not hot anymore. Okay, so I'm going to just basically do two cups. Ugh. There we go. Put your paddle attachment in. And we're going to do two tablespoons 
of molasses. So now, the other question is, what kind of molasses do you have to use? The, the, there's only a couple of different kind of molasses that you're going to find in the grocery store. You've got fancy, which is fancy, really, really high sugar. Uh, you have cooking molasses, which is basically a combo of fancy molasses and blackstrap. And blackstrap, which is the darkest, most bitter molasses. Um, what I use is I'll use basically whatever's on sale, whether it's fancy or cooking. That's it. So uh, nothing, nothing rocket sciencey about it. Okay, so we're gonna do two tablespoons of molasses. I love molasses. And again, if you buy this at Christmas time, look at that. Oh, this is gonna have a little bit of extra color. Love it. Love it. Now, a way to make the molasses not stick is if you, um, you can add a little bit of oil or you can just use your mixing bowl on your scale if you wanna actually measure it. But again, it's no issue. Measurement, oh, molasses is so good. Measuring is not an issue. Who is that? Who is? Who is? Oh, hey! OMG Pete. Nice to see you. We're making brown sugar. Don't tell the grocery stores. They'll be really mad at us. They're going to be really, really mad at us. Thanks for the follow. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, this is our, our secret, okay? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to start it on low. And... <laughs> shocker we're gonna let the mixer do the work it's gonna take about five minutes and we get to make our brown sugar as dark as we want it so my brown sugar this is brown sugar I made last week and it is beautiful and light and fluffy and I like it about this darkness. And look at, it's not sticking, it's not nothing. And it's not in an airtight, vacuum sealed container with bread and whatnot in it. It's just not, okay? It doesn't need to be, it's because it's, it's fresh. Okay, so I hope it's not too loud. I hope not. Now, let's, let me stand back and have a look, okay? This is where we're at so far, okay? So you need to scrape it down to make sure you've got all the molasses off of here. And this is gonna be kind of a medium dark. If you only want a hint of, uh, if you want a really, really light brown sugar, then just put less molasses in or add some extra white sugar. If you say, okay, I added a little bit too much um, molasses, dump a bit of sugar in there. Thank you, Smitten. Sounds good, sounds good. Yeah, so if, if you go and accidentally dump a whole bunch of molasses, just add some extra brown sugar. Or extra white sugar. To the batch and then it'll just combine up now people assume that it's going to get all gross i have i have other videos on online that show this exact process and the it's hard to believe that molasses will mix in with white sugar and you know what it absolutely does have you seen, uh, yes i've seen the paddle attachment with the little spatula on the side yeah, I've seen that. I uh, I wouldn't mind getting one of those actually, but my mixer is almost kind of on its last leg, and uh, I've been having I've been eyeballing a new mixer, and uh, I would love 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 to get a new mixer. But yeah, I've seen those. But the thing is, like you know, they're forty bucks or whatever. I don't know if I don't know. I love my mixer though. I've had this thing for fifteen years, so it's. 
uh, it's done me well. Now, sometimes what you'll find is if you don't start it on a slow speed, do not crank it up because you will kick out sugar everywhere. Start it on a slow speed. And actually, this is behaving quite nicely because usually it takes a little bit more to get the two mixed in together. So once it's, it's starting to come together like it is now, then you can crank it up. Because you want to get all of that molasses combined really, really well. My parents got us a KitchenAid this year and it changed my culinary in-house game. Oh, it changes everything. It absolutely does. Meringues and brown sugar and so, so many things. Yeah, oh, that hot chocolate is so good. Okay, let's see where we're at. Let's have a look see. Oh, this is so nice. Let me get a scraper so I can make sure that, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Yep, 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 yep. And it's so light and it's so unbelievable. Let me get a sip, there you go. Uh, okay, so that, uh, you know what, yet again, oh, this is like, this is, this should, this should just not be right <laughs> for how simple it is. It, it should not be right. <laughs> so anybody who says, oh, I can't make that. I don't have any brown sugar. I got to go to the store. Do not pay double the price for brown sugar. At the store so and when you have I have this already so what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to add one to the other and let's say your first batch one batch you have in the jar is way lighter than the other you basically can just dump both both into your mixer and just give them a whirl together and they'll combine into the same darkness of brown sugar but if you need like if you want to make chewy cookies uh, and your recipe you all white sugar and it's nice crispy crispy cookie but you want chewy ones you cut half of the recipe with brown sugar instead of using all white sugar and you will have chewy cookies because that's what brown sugar does and when you want to make uh, rubs and marinades and things like that See, my first mixture was a little bit uh, lighter. That's an awesome example. So it's kind of compressed down a little bit. And this is how fluffy it is here. This is the fresh batch. And then you just mix it all together. And you will never run out of brown sugar again. And I always just have, I mean, you, you can have may, uh, molasses and white sugar at home, always on the ready. And whenever you need to make it, that's all it takes. So, there's another one. Just that simple. Just that simple. It's almost, it seems almost criminal just to have this recipe with two ingredients in five minutes. So, but don't tell the grocer that. You just, you just start making your own. Just make your own. Okay, I need to get my other coffee because I'm, I have to have my coffee and I have to put this in the fridge because that's the safe thing to do. So that's our ricotta, done. And in the fridge, ready to go. And then let's put this guy away because the last thing we're gonna do is yet another, hey, BAT, how's it going? Nice to see you. How you been? We're just DIYing it today. Oh, thanks for the host, BAT. That's awesome. Thank you. How's your week going? I hope you're having a good week. I can't believe it's Friday already. That's insanity. Where did the week go? I have no idea. Okay, we're going to put the mixer away. Oh, thanks for the follow. 
thank you so much i'm glad you're here and i'm glad you're following that is awesome thanks for the support we're gonna get this this puppy put away because actually our next recipe final recipe of the day doesn't actually need the stove but not unlike just a guy i hate having everything in disarray kind of gets on my last nerve i don't like it so i'm gonna just put that over there for now because our last recipe needs if i'm not mistaken it's two whole ingredients again i kind of like this two whole ingredient business yeah two whole ingredients two whole ingredients now we got our chocolate and we're gonna use some coconut oil Yeah, I heard somebody come home. There you go. I thought I did. All right. So now what we're going to do is we are going to make... Um, <laughs> yeah, I know organization, hey? Small but huge details. Absolutely. Because I don't like to be tripping over stuff. Now, we're going to be making... Uh, you know the chocolate shell that you get at the store in the squeeze bottle that you put over ice cream and it hardens and it's just fantastic and it's so yummy? Okay, that's what we're making, but we're making it for super, super cheap and again, two ingredients and super lazy. Uh -huh. I need to change the name of my channel from Cookery Nation to Super Cheap and Super Lazy because that would probably describe things better. Okay, now I like to use, you can use um chocolate chips semi-sweet i like semi-sweet or dark uh 65 to 72 percent is the best to use for this but okay ba ba tlc later thanks for popping by and for, and for the follow thanks so much see you later um if i'm going to put this chocolate shell onto ice cream and whatnot what i'm putting it on is really really sweet already so i don't need my chocolate to be so heavily sweet so i like the darker chocolate but keep in mind this works yeah we'll talk on discord absolutely i'm going to put all the recipes on discord too okay so we've got uh, six recipes i'll put it on discord and then we can chat awesome bata i'll see you later um you can use this with any chocolate chips that you buy in the store because it's all tempered chocolate, okay? So if you have peanut butter chips, butterscotch chips, white chocolate chips, if you prefer milk chocolate chips, you can do that too. Um, I like to use dark chocolate. So, and if you recognize these, these are basically the chocolate from Costco and it's the dark chocolate which I really enjoy and it's so good for you. Okay, so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just give these a bit of a rough chop, nothing extraordinary, okay? Only just because I want it to melt a little bit quicker, that's all. And again, you can do this in a double boiler on the stove. Just make sure you don't let any steam get into the bowl or you can just do it in the microwave and just do it at 30 second bursts until it's all melted. That's all there is to it. And like I said, I'm not gonna go crazy with chopping this, this chocolate. I just wanna make it easier to melt. That's really all there is to it. I cannot believe we are on recipe number six already. Holy man. See, and then I'll be able to tidy up and then show you this. This should be able to cool down so that I can show you this in action. In action. Okay. So I'm just going to put this in the bowl. And like I say, no microwave, no problem. Just do it on the stovetop on the double boiler. Okay. So I'm going to put this in the microwave for 30 seconds. And do not let it boil. Just get it 
to where most of it is melted just most of it you, you'll probably have chunks in it as well but once you stir it then it will be um, it'll be fine it'll all come together nicely okay where's my there it is there it is okay while that's melting and it would take probably nothing more really than 10 minutes on the stove top if you do it in a double boiler so what i'm going to do is i'm going to actually bring it over so you can see at the intervals okay so this was after really 30 seconds okay there we go 30 seconds and it's starting, where were they? It's starting to melt, but not, definitely not near where we need it. But I'm not gonna put it on for another minute. I'm just gonna go for 30 seconds. There we go. And what do, how do I like to store this? I store this in a squeeze bottle on the counter. For 30 days ish or I will put it in um, ice cube trays and when I want to make sure that I'm being a really good girl and, and not indulging too much I will fill each ice cube container section half full of the chocolate and then I will once it's frozen hard I pop it all out throw the cubes into a freezer bag and then every time I want to have ice cream I will put one in the microwave just to heat it up and uh, then pour it over my ice cream and then it'll stay indefinitely so if you're concerned about keeping these kind of things on the counter um, then just throw them in ice cube trays ice cube trays and freeze them and they stay perfectly lovely Otherwise, you want to keep it at room temperature because otherwise it will be solid and then you have to heat it up in the microwave. So, so we need 30 more seconds. Squeeze bottles, yay! Just make sure they're food grade. Don't get them just from the dollar store just in case they're not food grade. And then if you're storing acidic food in a, in a squeeze bottle, it could be bad news. So I get mine. I just got some new ones. Where did I just put it? Here it is. I just got these. They were on sale from, uh, it's the Williams candy making ones. So you know that they're food safe. Okay. All righty. So let's, let's pull our attention over to here and we'll have a look at this chocolate. You'll notice that the chocolate is still kind of chunky. Okay, so it's still kind of chunky. But once I start stirring it, the residual heat in the chocolate will finish the melting. If you boil your chocolate, you will break your chocolate and your chocolate will be extremely unhappy. And we do not want that. It'll get grainy and gritty and gross and you'll have wasted it. So let's not do that. Now, this is coconut oil. It will melt at 74 degrees. So, I am using, well, I made it to six before I had to leave. Thanks, Lisa, for a great new learning. I'll return next time. Awesome, Cozy Kramer. Thanks so much for coming. I'll put the recipes on the Discord so that you can grab them up, okay? Have a good day. <laughs> I'll be back. All right, thank you. I use... Um, unrefined coconut oil you can get refined coconut oil it's all clear and everything it doesn't taste anything like coconut oil but i don't find that this tastes overly coconut -y. so i'm cool with it okay but you can get refined coconut oil which is see-through and it won't taste coconutty at all so we're going to dump two tablespoons of coconut oil into your melted chocolate and what that's going to do is it's just going to basically melt the coconut oil
Okay, so we're going to put this. And if you find that the coconut oil is not melting, then you can give it a, a 10 second zap in the microwave. It's not a, not a big issue. Just do not over microwave it. That would not be happy. And again, if you were doing this on the stovetop and the double boiler, you just throw in the coconut oil really any time. You can do it right at the beginning if you like. It doesn't really matter. Uh, these are such forgiving, forgiving basic recipes. Maybe that's why they make so much money off of these products because they're just so basic and simple. Okay. So everything is melted. It's all combined. I do like to sometimes put a dash, a dash of salt because chocolate and salt just go so well together. And I mean, you don't have to put salt in because if you're going to coat something, you might want to put some hard, uh, like kosher salt on top of the chocolate, which is yummy, yummy, yummy. Okay. Look at it. It's all melted. It's all nice and smooth. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow that to, uh, come to room temperature. And then, you know what? I think I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to get a scoop of ice cream so I can demo this magic shell for you. I just don't think it would be fair for me not to demo the magic shell for you. Don't put it in a, in a squeeze bottle until it's cooled down. And make sure that you take your handy dandy labels and label when you made it. You know, if it's going to last that long. I mean, same with the ice cream uh, tray ones. <laughs> demo time okay yeah this is gonna be and I have that lovely vanilla ice cream that I made this week and the chocolate and again the one thing you want to consider if you're gonna add anything to this is that chocolate hates water so if you're gonna decide to put vanilla extract or anything like that in it if it's too much more than a drop or two you will break your chocolate, so don't do that. Um, you can, if you want, let's say you want a peanut butter chocolate magic shell, basically take out some of the chocolate and sub it in for a tablespoon or two of peanut butter. Melt it all together, add the coconut oil, let it come down to room temperature, Bob's your uncle. So if you have um, butterscotch chips, peanut butter chips, um, what else do they have in chip form in the grocery store? White chocolate, butterscotch, peanut butter, various and sundry levels of chocolate, sweet chocolate. Then you can use that. But just be careful if you want to add any extracts or flavorings. Something that would be really good that would not affect your chocolate would be if you had, uh, if you grated some orange zest into this would be really quite yummy just be careful what what you're putting in your squeeze bottle but what i would do if i wanted to have the dark chocolate orange is i would pour as soon as i poured on my uh chocolate onto my ice cream i would have lemon or orange zest already rasped and then i would sprinkle it on right away and then it would into the chocolate it would be so good so so good so as we let this cool um, what I'm going to do is I am going to get this stuff put away. I'm going to put my, um, I'm going to put my teriyaki away in yet another jar because I'm, I'm a lover of jars. So whatever I have left over of this teriyaki sauce, I am going to put in the freezer so you can see this recipe how much this makes just about a full jar of the teriyaki oh I don't have a wrong label on that there you go there we go beautiful oh so so good okay that's that so now just a guy you are well equipped with the brown sugar 
I don't want to hear about you buying brown sugar anymore. And the magic shell. And the mustard. That's going to be awesome. And your little boy can help you with that for sure. That's cool. That All of these are fun recipes too. That if he can make a popsicle with a little bit of help, he can definitely, definitely make any one of these guys. And he would be just over the moon over it. I think he'd really, really enjoy it. And then, and too, with this magic shell, the other nice thing you can do is if you've got strawberries or peaches or oranges, you can section them out, put them on a cookie tray, pop them in the freezer, put some of your magic shell in a bowl and dip your strawberries or oranges or whatever pieces in, or put them in the squeeze bottle and psh, put nice drizzle all over it and as soon as it hits makes contact with the frozen fruit or the chilled fruit it will get rock hard and it but it melts in your mouth once you put it in your mouth it's awesome <laughs> yeah we're just about to get the ice cream have our lovely ice cream vanilla ice cream with chocolate sauce let's see here there it is wah, wah, wah. okay put that away get that put away we're gonna have some lovely teriyaki wings tonight for supper too easy with a bit of rice and some CSA veg which will be awesome loving all the extra kohlrabi I got it went really well in the stir fry last night actually it wasn't even a stir fry I just sauteed them oh I get to eat ice cream before supper it is a good good day a very very good day nice perfect scoop of ice cream and make sure this is cooled down oh just about oh mmm sad gotta taste it mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay ice cream oh I hope we have enough, enough ice cream for everybody tonight to have some magic shell on it as well oh and you could sprinkle coconut on top right before it sets that would be awesome and if you toast your coconut that'd be even better even better oh yeah hey rams how's it going thanks for popping by good to see you we're just Finishing so many DIY projects. We did mustard and we did uh, cheese and we did teriyaki sauce and we did hot chocolate mix and brown sugar. How could I possibly forget the brown sugar? And now we're doing chocolate magic shell. All of these things you can make in minutes at home. Way cheaper, way yummier. Not all the extra everything in it. And uh, if you look down at my Discord link, you can come join us on Discord where I'm going to post all the recipes for all of what I've made today. And it's just too simple. Too, too simple. So now I think I'm going to put this in my handy dandy jar. And then I'll use my funnel. And this should just fit quite nicely in here and if you find that you've got this on the counter and it starts to get solid then just uh, what I normally do is just get a bowl of warm water and sit the squeeze bottle in the warm water and it'll just warm up that the oil and give it a shake 
and uh, it'll work. It'll it'll warm up, and it'll work like a charm. But like anything homemade, it's only going to last about a month on the counter. And then, gosh darn it, if you haven't eaten it, you'll just have to make more, won't you? There we go. Put the lid on. Oh, and see, see how professional you look with the lovely little squeeze bottle? And just make sure you have a squeeze bottle with a lid, because that's kind of important. Kind of important. Now, um, this is still a little bit warm, but we're still going to see if it does its thing. Now, the it's going to get hard, and once it's not shiny, shiny, shiny anymore, oopsie, then it will be hardened off. It's a little bit warm still, so we'll just give it a few extra seconds. It would take about, oh, if this was at room temperature, take about 10 seconds or whatever to, to harden up. So if you're going to put extra toppings on, sprinkles, whatnot, then make sure you're ready to because uh, I think it's already hardened by now and that was still a little bit warm. So, Okay, let's have a look and see if, if it actually worked. There we go. Okay. Now you could use a spoon and really. Okay. Ah. You hear it? Um, okay. Oh, there we are. Okay. See, it's all hardened up nicely. I can actually even pick it up mmm yep yup 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 that's it mmm mmm but it's not so hard some people put corn syrup in theirs because they want it to be all soft and um, really smooth but I find this way smooth it doesn't get hard at all I don't find it hard at all you see how it breaks off and it's awesome and it's nice nice and hard and it doesn't take long at all mm, 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 mm. keep it in a squeeze bottle and it is fantastic fantastic but if you know somebody who has a sweet tooth blues music like i was saying with the strawberries and such so nice you just do and you don't have to do much because actually i use dark chocolate for this so it's not really overly sweet and i didn't add any sweetener to it it's just the chocolate and uh dark chocolate is way less sweet than than um milk chocolate say so this i don't like to add sweet on top of sweet so this is a little bit got a little bit more body to it not nearly as sweet so you get that deep chocolate mixed in with the vanilla ice cream. Goes fantastic on strawberry ice cream. Goes good on any ice cream, quite frankly. And you could also, something that would be quite a nice little treat is if you have a lovely dollop of whipped cream on top of your hot chocolate. And if the dollop of whipped cream was frozen and you put a little this guy on there, wow, you are just too fancy for words. Too, too fancy for words. Uh, yeah, they're going to all be on the blog. They're all going to be on the discourse, Discord. I think the only one I think that isn't on uh, my blog yet, this you guys are the first ones to get it, is my magic shell. And I noticed the other day, I'm like, wait a minute, I've been making magic shell for years. And that's one of the ones I actually don't have on the website. That makes zero sense. So I'm going to put all the printables that we did today on the Discord so it's just really easy to find. All of the recipes and discussion about the recipes are on uh, my website, Cookery Nation blog. Um, and easy peasy to find. Once I get the uh, magic shell one worked up, I mean it is two ingredients after all. 
it might take me a while to get the recipe made up. Um, once I get it done, I'll put it up on the website and on the Discord. Okay, just a guy. I'm glad I was able to get to your brown sugar in time. Not a problem. Uh, I'll put them up so that you can access them and you can show your wife and then you guys can decide what you want to make. Take it easy. Thanks for popping by. I'm glad you came by. So anyways, he's leaving just in time because we are all done. So we did the, the mustard and the cheese and the teriyaki sauce, which is going to go on my chicken and in my freezer. Too easy. And the ricotta cheese was awesome. If you guys have any questions, uh, just come on to the Discord and we, you can ask and uh, I'll go through it with you. No problem. But most of these recipes took us, I want to say less than five minutes each to make. And uh, I'll bet you they were at least a third, if not cheaper, of the price that, than what you would buy in the grocery stores. And quite frankly, they are way yummier. So I hope you try it out. And uh, if you have any feedback or whatever, uh, let me know. If you have any questions, just come on over and we'll all pitch in and give a hand. But that was my, my uh, DIY bliss for today. And uh, I'll do other DIYs. And if you guys have any uh, DIYs you're wondering if I make, uh, let me know. Just uh, pop on over and ask. And if I haven't made it, I'm pretty sure I can figure out how to make it. Just let me know. Anyways, for everybody who's new today, thank you so much for coming by. I'm so happy that you came by and supported the stream. And I will let you know as soon as I have my regular schedule. I'm hoping three times a week. Um, but I'll let you know. I'll give you plenty of, uh, plenty of notice. <laughs> I'm glad you found it easy. Absolutely, Smitten. Thanks so much for coming by. I will check you later. Come on by. And if you have any questions, just, just let me know. Just let me know. And hopefully I'll do more DIYs if you guys like them. And, and then, of course, we'll do full meals and single recipes. If you have any requests or whatever, just let me know. Just let me know. I'm going to take off now. Thanks so much for hanging out with me the whole time. I will uh, check you later. And I'll let you know when we're coming back online. Probably on Monday. We'll have a look-see. Okay, thank you so much. I will talk to you guys later. Have a great, great weekend. See you. Bye-bye.